Well, our theme for the year, for those who are visiting today, is committed. And I'm going to speak this morning on being committed to God's Word. Committed to God's Word. And I'd like you to turn to a story. It's a story of Jesus being tempted of Satan. It's a great passage because it shows that even though Jesus was the embodiment of Scripture, he is called, one of his titles in Scripture is called the Word, that he himself lived by his word and quoted his word in dealing with the tempter. In chapter 4 of Matthew, beginning in verse number 1, we begin with the story. It said, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now it's interesting, he, he had just come off of a high in his ministry, and that was coming and being baptized by John the Baptist. He, of course, didn't need to be baptized in the fact that he was the one who would die and would be buried and would rise from the dead, but he wanted his followers to go through that act of baptism after they trusted Christ as their Savior so that they could identify with his death as burial and resurrection. There were two times that God audibly spoke to his son on earth, when Christ was on the earth. This was one of them. In his baptism in Matthew 3, 13 to 7, 17, the Bible says in verse 17, And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. One of the things that pleased the Father is Jesus always did what the Father asked of him. He said, I do always those things which please my Father. And one of those things that he did that pleased the Father was he bound himself by his own word. Now, we as, as individuals struggle sometimes with binding ourselves to our word. And so we'll make promises to our kids, we'll make promises to friends and family and other people that we know, and we'll have to say, I'm sorry, but I forgot I had this obligation, I can't. People make plans and they have to unravel those plans because we can't keep our word. God never has to unravel plans because everything he does, he does on purpose. And God is bound by his word. And so he is sending his son into the wilderness to be tempted of Satan. And somehow, some way, uh, Satan uh, in his head lies to himself thinking that he truly was going to be able to move Jesus and change his mind and tempt him. So beginning at verse 1, it says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungered. Now there have been a few in Scripture who fasted that long and survived. And Jesus was one of them. And as Jesus had fasted that 40 days and 40 nights, he was very hungry because he was living in an earthly body that needed food. And Satan comes in an interesting way and tempts him with the fact that he was hungry as if it was a bad thing to be hungry. He was hungry on purpose. He chose to do without food for spiritual reasons. But whether we do it for that or whether we do it because in our life there are things that come and we wind up doing without a meal or two, there's nothing wrong with being hungry. And when Satan comes to tempt him, it's interesting how he words it. First, he, can, he cast doubt of the validity of who Jesus is as the Son of God in every setup of his temptation. In verse 3 it says, And when the tempter came, this is Satan, when the tempter came to him, he said, If 
thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now what he didn't anticipate is that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are always in agreement. As a triune Godhead, they are always on the same page and they never do anything or make any decisions separately than any, any of the other persons in the Godhead. But Satan thought he could divide the Trinity. And you don't. And so he is saying here, I know that <clears throat> you are hungry for a reason. I think the Father doesn't love you. Or if he did, he wouldn't have left you here without food. And that's what he whispers in the ear of every one of us when we go through the difficulties of life with food and raiment. You see, God puts us through things sometimes to make us trust Him and to show that He can keep His Word and follow through on His Word, though Satan tells us He won't. And so he comes to Jesus and he says in verse number 4, or verse number 3, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Since the Father has let you down, since he doesn't love you, then take matters into your own hands and just take these stones here on the ground and make them bread. Provide for yourself outside of the provision of your Father. Here's what happens when you and I take things into our own hands and we take things out of God the Father's hands. We make a mess. And this would have been a defeat for the Lord Jesus Christ. It would have been sin. Because whatsoever is not of faith is what? Is sin. And so Christ had full faith in the Father for what was going on. He trusted him as he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He also trusted him in sending him, being led by the Spirit, that's the other person of the Godhead, leading him into the wilderness. He also trusted him as he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and was very hungry. And Satan couldn't move him because he was committed to his word, and so should we. Here's the verse that Jesus quotes to Satan. Go to Genesis, actually um, Deuteronomy chapter 8, in verse number 3. Jesus met the temptation of Satan with this. Deuteronomy chapter 8, in verse 3, says, And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Here's how Jesus quoted it in the New Testament. Going back to Matthew chapter 4, it says, But he answered and said, as Satan said, Command these stones to be made bread. It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. There is no question that we need to have food to live. But what we don't understand is we also need the Word of God to live. It is spiritual food. There, were, there was a time when they 
were out of bread and the disciples were asked, were Jesus mentioned, or the disciples mentioned to Jesus, we need to get bread. And he said to them, I have meat that ye know not of. Those who are spiritual, believing Christians who are committed to the Lord are going to be committed to his word and understand that it is, it is, is more important than your physical food to feed your soul. The word of God is your spiritual food, and yes, you need to eat. And I'm not telling so. I'm not telling you don't. You know, if you, if you don't, I'm not telling you not to go out of here and not eat for 40 days. Okay, what I'm telling you is do both. Being committed to the Lord is being committed to His Word. So Christ again met this temptation head on. Feeding the inner spiritual person is far more important than feeding the physical. God tests us and proves us in the ordinary things of life, like eating and drinking. Jesus lived by the authority of God's Word, and so should we. Jesus had the Word hidden in his heart. David says, Thy Word have I hid in my heart, thy mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. And because Christ had it committed in him, he refused to sin and make the stones to be bred. Well, Satan isn't ever done after the first temptation. If he is not successful with one, he's going to come back with another. And even if he is successful with one, he's going to come back with another and another and another. And so <clears throat> he doesn't relent. He doesn't fold up his, you know, fold his hands and, and turn tail. He comes back for a second round in verses 5 to verse 7. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Now, this, this, before we get into this temptation, I want you to ask yourself this question. If Jesus is not God, then how did he do this? Can, can you envision him f floating up or just elevating up and, being, and standing on the pinnacle of the temple and looking down, way down from that vantage point with Satan? Satan was an angel, a creation of God, and Jesus was made a little lower than the angels as a man, but as the God-man, he still had supernatural abilities to do thing that, things that no other man could do, and this is one of those occasions. And so Satan takes him up, and they're both up standing on this pinnacle, this high point of the temple, and Satan says... To him in verse, verse number 6, he saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, again questioning his deity, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. I want you to leave your finger there, and I want you to go to Psalm 91, and verse 11, because this is the verse that he quoted. And I want you to see if there are any words that were left out. Psalm 91 and verse 11. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Interesting. That last phrase to keep thee in all thy ways is not there. And here's why. Because Satan not only quotes scripture, but he also misquotes scripture over and over and over again. That is why the Bible says, and why we should be committed to the word, study to show thyself 
approved unto God, a workman, that means you're digging out the truth and understanding of what it means, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, knowing what it says and being able to stand upon it. And Christ knew what it said. He knew the verse. And he knew before Satan got done, he had left that phrase out. You see, the fact of the matter is, is even being the Son of God, to not allow him, if he chose to do that, to hit, hit the ground and die would have been a violation of the Word of God. And Christ knew that. And so he answers Satan, going back to our text, again with the Word of God. And the verse that he uses is Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 16, which we're going to turn to really quickly. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 16. In Deuteronomy 6 and verse 16, this is what he quotes. Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God as ye tempted him in Massa. Jesus, in verse number 7, tells Satan, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. This was a temptation for Jesus to violate what the Scripture said. Because when we are out of the will of God and we are violating a principle of Scripture, we are on unblessed ground because we're disobedient. And had Christ jumped off, the angels would not have been there. Because if they had been there, then God's word would not be true. The reason God has his angels to keep us in all our ways is we, they are there to keep us in our ways as our ways are God's ways, as we are following the ways of the Lord. And jumping off the pinnacle of the temple was not God's will and not God's plan for Jesus. But in a moment of temptation, Satan craftily comes to Jesus and tries to twist the word of God. Do you know how many things that you can prove to be, how, how many things you can validate that you believe are true by twisting scripture? All kinds of people do things and justify them based upon their interpretation of Scripture, what they believe that God says. Um, this illustration is kind of silly, but um, there was a, a person, and I, I, I heard this, and this may be true. Uh, you go on Snopes, and you can find out if it's true or not, okay? But anyway, they took their Bible, they flipped it open, and it said, Judas went out and hung himself, because they were waiting to hear from God. So they opened it, they did this again, they dropped it open again, and it says, go thou and do likewise. <laughs> it's not how to find out God's plan. We don't live flippantly with the word. We don't make decisions and choices flippantly in our life. We base them upon biblical principles that are taught in scripture. And Jesus showed this is how to live. He says, don't tempt the Lord. And he was referring to himself. And he didn't jump. By the way, neither should we when Satan tells us to. Neither should we make decisions and choices when God is not telling us to. We should never violate the principles of his word. That's why we should be committed to knowing it and following it. The third temptation comes back in Matthew 4, verses 8 through 11. 
Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Back to Deuteronomy 6 and verse 13. This is the verse Jesus quotes to Satan and we'll drive this point home. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 13, the Bible says, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve Him and shalt swear by His name. And so when Jesus says, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Verse 11 says, Then the devil leaveth him. And behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Whether it's the devil himself, or whether he enters into the mind of either a believer or a non-believer, and they say something to you that sounds like the hiss of a serpent, like Jesus experienced when he was with Peter, and Peter, he asked the question, Whom do men say that I am? And Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then not moments later, he tells the disciples, All of you are going to be offended. I'm going to die. And Peter says to Jesus, I will never do that, and I'll never allow that. Jesus whips around to Peter, and he looks at Peter, and he makes this statement, Get thee behind me, Satan. You say, well, what kind of a temptation would this be to Jesus? It was none, but what, what, what Satan was trying to do is he was trying to fast forward the kingdom of God early. Christ knew before this temptation that the kingdoms of the world were already given to him. And his kingdom was prophesied centuries and millennium later. But if he would have established the kingdom then, there would be no cross. There would be no burial. There would be no resurrection. And there would be no salvation. And this is Satan's mission since day one. He has despised and hated the plan of salvation from the moment it was conceived or it was put into effect in the garden when God clothed man with coats of skins to protect his nakedness. Sin bears all. Sin opens us up and lets people see what we really are. And thank God Christ cleanses us and washes it away and allows us to stand before God perfect in His sight. When we're committed to the Word of God, we're not willing to buy into Satan's lie that we can bypass cost and bypass certain things to see God's blessing. Jesus said, A servant is not greater than his Lord. And the Bible says that we are to take up our cross, deny ourselves, and take up our cross and follow Him. So many people want to bypass the taking up of the cross and denying Him and want to go directly to go and collect their prize as they come around early. Christ wouldn't do so. He said, I'm not, I'm not buying into it. Satan offered Christ the easy way. Jesus did not take the easy way. Yes, the Bible says he despised the shame. But the Bible says 
for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. And for the joy that is set before us, heaven, our eternal reward, the uniting of our family, our spiritual family before the throne of God and to be forgiven and to be saved and to be out of a body that gets sick and dies and, and suffers. We have a future as God's people that is beyond imagination, but there is a price in life and a process that we go through. And that's why the Word of God is so important. Too many Christian people today are living in a fantasy. They believe that life should be easy because Jesus said my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It, it is not talking about the load not being heavy. It is talking about the life that is going to be easy. It's easier to serve the Lord and it's a blessing to serve the Lord more than it is to serve the world. And so it's important for us to be committed to the Word. As we are committed to the Word, when Satan comes to us, the Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee. So how do we do that? Put up our fists? How many have ever heard of the, of the great Billy Sunday, the evangelist of our, in the United States, who uh, retired Chicago White Sox, actually walked away from the game, and he became an evangelist. Billy Sunday would often, and just and it was, and he was he was sensational as this, you know, he was, he could steal bases and he and the way he slid and and so he used some of those antics as he would would preach, sliding across the stage and so often he would put a ring, and he would get in that ring and he would pretend he was boxing with Satan. And that was all sensational kind of fun and so forth but the fact is it's it was really not a reality we don't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Satan the Bible is very clear that even the angels would not have confrontation Michael the archangel when disputing the Bible says over the body of Moses durst not put against him a railing accusation so he, he didn't make him mad. Because Michael knew that he, be, he was under the strength level of Satan. And so even Michael said, the Lord rebuke thee. So how do we do that? We know this book. And we say, the Lord rebuke thee. This is what God says. And this is what I'm going to do. Now leave me alone and go back where you belong. A commitment to the word means that we are willing to, to believe it and trust it as our only way of faith and practice. You say blind? No, not blind at all. Because once you become saved, the lights come on and you understand this like you couldn't before you were saved. The day I trusted Christ is the day that this, the Bible meant something to me. The Bible says, The natural man receiveth not the things of God, neither can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. Until I trusted Jesus, my eyes were closed to what this book meant. But once I asked Christ into my heart, this became a living book. And truly, as I read it, there are things that shoot off the page and things that God reveals and God speaks to my heart and convicts me and challenges me and stirs my heart and, and corrects me if I'm willing to submit to what it says. Are you committed to God's Word? Let's stand. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed.